Welcome, my name is Rory Martirana. I am a reference and adult services librarian at the Ives Main branch of the New Haven Free Public Library. Um, I coordinate our book sandwiched in author talks and some of our library health programs. Um, I also wanted to mention that we will also be partnering with Yale, um, Yale China on Tuesday at noon to talk to Deping Chen about her new collection of short stories. So please, um, if you're interested in that, check out nhfpl.org for info. I'm honored to introduce tonight's Democracy in America. I can't wait to watch the rest of it. Um, I think this is a very important topic. At the library, I am in the midst of a project to update um, the collection that I manage to reflect more diverse voices. So I feel like the timing is great. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over to Matt to get things started. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for being here. It's great to see you all here. Um, before we get started, I do have a few other thank yous. So thanks to our, our partners at the New Haven Free Public Library. This has just been a really important partnership uh, to us here in the Public Humanities Program. So thanks to Rory Martirana, uh, Marian Huggins, Seth Godfrey, Luis Chavez Bromel, Isaac Shubb, and all of their colleagues. Uh, and we look forward to the day when we can all see you in the library again. Uh, thanks also to my colleagues, uh, Karen Rothman, who's done so much for this series, and Svagato Chakravorty, who is working even now as we speak uh, behind the scenes on the back end of the webinar. Um, one program note, we have another, um, another discussion for the Democracy in America series coming up on Friday at noon. It's an unusual unusual time for us because our speaker is in London this semester and our normal start time wasn't quite working for him. But Christopher Newfield, who has emerged as really one of the most important um, historians and analysts and critics of higher education in America will be joining us for uh, a talk um, provocatively titled, Does Post-Democracy Need Universities? Higher Education After 2020. Um, so please join us Friday at noon for that. And as ever, um, these these uh, programs will be posted on our website uh, at some some juncture shortly after uh, the the date. Um, one last program note for tonight: um, do do not drive yourself crazy looking for the chat function. Um, it is not operational, but we will be taking questions in real time through the Q and A uh, box. So um, you can look for that at the at the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And um, I'll let you know when we'll open it up to the floor for your questions. Uh, so tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, and welcome Chitra Ramalingam. Uh, she is a historian of science and of photography. She received her she received her PhD in history of science from Harvard and served as a British Academy postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Cambridge before arriving here at Yale. Her first book, To See a Spark, Experiment and Visual Experience in Victorian Science, traces an unfamiliar path across the scientific and visual landscape of Victorian Britain, in which the physics laboratory is a key site for experimentation on human vision and for the exploration of new media like photography and cinema. In addition to her book, To See a Spark, Ramalingam is co-editor of William, William Henry Fox Talbot, Beyond Photography, with Miriam Brusius and Katrina Dean. Her ongoing projects include a book on the laboratory as, as an image archive in the modern physical sciences, a material history of Talbot's uh, photographic publication, The Pencil of Nature, and Out of Place, a series of experimental installations uh, involving resituating objects from Yale's natural history collections. Her research, teaching, and curatorial work range broadly across topics in science and culture, with a particular focus on the visual culture of physics, on 19th century ways of seeing, including the prehistory of cinema, on the early history of photography, and on decolonial museum practice, which she will be speaking on tonight. So please join me in welcoming Chitra Ramalingam. Welcome, Chitra. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today. And I'm also so happy to be hosted by the New Haven Free Public Library, which has been a really important institution for my family for the seven years that I've been living in New Haven. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna share my screen now. I have a kind of brief presentation. Um, 
go. Okay. So I'm here to talk about decolonizing the museum. And um, I want to be clear that I'm, I'm very much not presenting myself here as an expert on this or even as a practitioner of decolonizing museums. This, this is not going to be a how-to guide for how to decolonize or even it won't even fully be an argument for decolonizing museums, although many of the um, kind of actions and call to action that I am are going to describe today are, are, are changes that I support. But in fact, as I was preparing the slides this week, I realized upon reflection that I might have preferred to put a question mark after the title. So I'm just going to do that right now. And I'm speaking with you here today um, from my position as an educator and as a museum curator. And I want to think with you, the, the audience and, and Matt, um, about what this historical moment for museums that we're living through right now means. So what does it mean when activists increasingly call for museums to decolonize? In what way are museums colonial institutions at all? Is decolonization really possible? And what does it mean that so many museums are themselves beginning to describe their own work as decolonizing? Are the progressive changes that are underway at many museums now really decolonial at all? Museums have always been sites of struggle between collectors, museum workers, scholars and scientists, um, source communities for the objects that, they're, that, that the museums contain, and of course there are many publics, all of whom have had different aspirations for the institution and different ways of making meaning from their experiences there. But it does feel like we're in a new phase right now in the public discussion of museums and their colonial pasts, presents, and futures. Over the past decade, more and more activists and academics and others have been calling for museums to make changes, to present a more honest and morally complex narrative of history, and to embrace a role as agents of social change. And these calls have intensified amid the ongoing and kind of um, uh, recently gathering more momentum national reckoning over race and a racial justice movement that has refused to allow museums to present themselves as neutral containers of objects or as neutral platforms for debate. One marker of this is the way that these questions are beginning to play out in popular culture. In the 2018 movie Black Panther, about 15 minutes into the film, um, the movie supervillain Killmonger strides through a museum that is obviously meant as a fictionalized version of the British Museum in London. And he interrogates a white curator there <clears throat> about the provenance of one of the objects on display in the museum's African galleries. So she informs him that this object came from the Edo people of Benin. And he corrects her, saying that it was actually made in Wakanda and taken from the kingdom of Benin by British soldiers. And he reminds the curator that her predecessors violently stole that artifact and others. Then Killmonger and his accomplices, excuse me, his accomplices break the glass display case, withdraw the object, and remove it from the museum. Now, this is a, a fictional fantasy of restitution, of repatriating an already stolen object without waiting for permission. And it's carried out by the film's villain. So we are meant as viewers to reject Killmonger's violent actions here. And the scene resonates with, the, but the scene nonetheless resonates with the growing voices that have been expressing widespread pain and anger over museums' continuation of the legacies of European conquest and colonial rule. Since 2016, pausing only with the pandemic, an artist collective called Decolonize This Place has organized a yearly anti-Columbus Day tour of the American Museum of Natural History in New York City. So in these events, which have been happening yearly or did until 2019, um, hundreds of demonstrators troop through the museum. <clears throat> they chant, they drum, they unfurl banners that say things like respect the ancestors, decolonize, abolish white supremacy, Imagine. The participants in these actions offer radically different interpretations of the exhibits inside the museum, and they continually um, connect the displays in the museum and their implicit and explicit racial hierarchies to the gentrification and displacement unfolding outside the museum walls in New York City. So this image I'm showing is from the first event they held there um, in 2016, 
um, in which the activist threw a parachute over the notorious equestrian statue of uh, former President Theodore Roosevelt on the steps of the museum. Now in this um, sculpture, Roosevelt is flanked by an African and a Native American man in a vision of racial hierarchy. And um, in a culmination of years of activism around this statue, last June, the Museum of Natural History announced that it would finally be removed. Although to my knowledge, the statue is still there, but they've announced that they've asked for it to be removed. Now that outcome is clearly linked with the broader recent history of removing and rethinking Confederate statues in the US. And it's certainly a part of that history. But it's also about the museum itself as an institution. It's easier for a statue to just come down than it is to take down an entire museum. Museums are another matter altogether. As Lonnie Bunch, the founding director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, and now the sec secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, as Lonnie Bunch has said, you could easily rewrite a textbook, but you can't rewrite a museum. Returning stolen and sacred objects or tearing down statues are perhaps the most well-known example in this now widespread conversation about whether and how museums are to be decolonized. But the issues go much deeper than that. The origins of the Euro-American museum and its culture can be traced back to what were known as cabinets of curiosity in early modern Europe. So these were private spaces where gentlemen scholars gathered objects of all kinds from around the world. And the image I'm showing you here is the collection of the, the Danish professor of medicine, Ole Wurm, which was collected in the first half of the 17th century. And in this depiction, you can see that objects are arranged according to a kind of hierarchical taxonomy, rising up from stones and minerals through plants and animals to human anatomy and eventually to man-made artifacts. Now this habit of amassing, accumulating objects from distant locales and distant times and arranging, categorizing, and presenting them in a display within one's own, within one's own domestic household to share with an elite circle of personal acquaintances for their learning and enjoyment. All of this still remains part of the deep inner code of most present day museums. Even once museums were reworked and reimagined in the 19th century as public institutions. And this is reflected in um, the International Council of Museums current definition of what a museum is, which emphasizes these key actions, acquiring, um, conserving, researching, communicating, displaying or exhibiting. <clears throat> and we can talk later, um, maybe in the, in the conversation later about how contested this definition actually is and how contested its proposed replacement has become. But put really simply, this acquisitive impulse, this obsession with amassing and arranging and preserving global objects all in one place, this was a part of the European colonial project of expansion into Africa and Asia, into Oceania, into the Americas. And these habits of accumulating, preserving, reorganizing, and displaying objects from the remotest corners of the earth proved a crucial tool in those expansion projects. The successors of the early modern cabinets, like the one I showed you a moment ago, are the big museums like the Met in New York City, the British Museum in London, the Louvre and the Quai Branly in Paris. These are sites of accumulation at the metropolitan centers of the European empires. They've sometimes been called universal museums or museums of world cultures. They see themselves as the storehouses of the world's cultural artifacts. In North America, the amassing of Native American artifacts and human remains for collection and museums began almost immediately after European settlement began. Objects and bodies were acquired through trade and purchase through theft and looting, and through the excavation of ancient burial mounds. And the period during which many important museum collections in the US were founded and collecting flourished was also the period of dramatic population decline and enormous suffering for tribal nations across the Americas due to a combination of disease, forced relocation, and genocidal governmental policies. And so the urgent collecting of artifacts of what were described as vanishing people and the violent actions and policies that led to that apparent vanishing were inseparable elements of the same process. And so the question is, if you, if you see things this way, if you see museums as so completely colonial in their origin, in the very basis for their existence, and in the ongoing work that their collections do 
in making the colonial past ever present? Is decolonizing, is undoing that process even possible? And now in this kind of itemization, <laughs> Um, I, I want to be clear that this is not a framework for action that I'm proposing. It's a kind of inventory of the sorts of projects and calls for change that I've been following and that, I've, that I see frequently in, invoked under the heading decolonizing the museum. And so the first is the question of representation, um, the kind of diversity and inclusion paradigm, which will be familiar to all of us. So here the issue is of both personnel and of audience. Who gets to work in museums? Who gets to make decisions? Why are so many of those people white? Many calls for decolonizing museums focus on this issue of hiring, on ensuring that there are um, museum workers who come from multiple perspectives and backgrounds. And the, um, I'm showing a screenshot here of an article a couple of years ago um, describing the public outcry after the Brooklyn Museum hired um, a white curator um, for its African collections. <clears throat> and so there are issues here around um, hiring practices, but also around the nature of expertise and the, the pipeline by which people are able to get into um, those kind of expert positions. Another kind of element of decolonizing um, agendas for some institutions um, focus more on um, interpretation, and narratives, and perspectives. So the idea here is that museums need to, urgently need to expand the perspectives that they portray beyond those of the dominant cultural group. Um, and I'm, I'm showing here a screenshot of the, um, the website for a recent exhibition at the Yale University Art Gallery, which um, represented a kind of a really important step in Yale working to reconcile its role within the history of salvage museum anthropology. So the curatorial team for this exhibition, which um, um, first opened a couple of years ago, but due to the pandemic, um, kind of had a lengthier run, but limited visibility in the end. The team was led by students, and they accomplished this um, sort of decolonial um, sensibility by explicitly naming the mechanisms of settler colonial that, colonialism that led to the objects in this exhibition arriving in Yale collections, and importantly, by foregrounding community voices in the display of indigenous art. So in every aspect of this exhibition's conception and its spatial organization, the exhibition worked against the structures of natural history institutions and the way that such objects have typically been displayed in universal museums. So for example, instead of organizing by chronology or by geographical locale, um, the exhibition was organized by distinct epistemological themes and community narratives. And so this exhibition was designed to work against these remnants of that kind of cabinet of curiosity institutional vision. Then kind of going one step further, there are issues around repatriation, restitution, and repair. And so here I'm mostly referring to the formalized processes of return by which stolen or sacred objects or um, human remains are returned to the communities from which they were taken. For objects and, and human remains belonging to Native American groups, there is NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, a federal law that is designed to compel and facilitate return to tribal communities. Um, or just in this week's news, the Penn Museum in Philadelphia announced its action plan, its new action plan for um, repatriating um, and seeing to the reburial of the remains of enslaved Black Africans whose, whose skulls had shockingly been on view in the museum until last summer. And the action plan, which they've just published, is based on the NAGPRA model. And so it requires the creation of an infrastructure within the institution, um, a set of committees that are, that are empowered to develop um, relationships with identified source communities and a commitment to making decisions in collaboration with those source communities. The action plan involves hiring. So it involves um, the hiring of a bioanthropologist um, who it's been stated um, will need to be a person of color, and that person will be both a curator and a professor at Penn. Um, and so you can see how the kind of um, the representation and sort of paradigm that I described earlier is implicated in the repatriation process. Another example, um, and this is not of an action that's happened yet, but rather one around which there's a lot of activism, is the Benin bronzes at the British Museum, which are referenced pretty directly in the Black Panther scene that I mentioned earlier. 
these metal plaques and sculptures were stolen by the British from the ancient Edo kingdom of Benin in 1897 in what is now Nigeria. And they were taken during the destruction of Benin city and the, the violent massacre of its population in an expedition whose cruelty is um, documented in, in incredible detail in the journals of the British officers who carried it out. Um, activists, the Nigerian government, uh, uh, there are a lot of players that have been calling for the, um, the repatriation of these objects from the British Museum. It's one of the prized objects in their collection. Um, and they've done a lot of work around uh, reinterpreting the objects around trying to foreground the history that led to their acquisition, um, but they have not yet been they've not yet been sent back. I might mention as, as an aside that um, many of the some of the Benin bronzes were they were all taken back to Britain. Many of them were then scattered to institutions around the world, especially in Europe and America, and there are a few at Yale as well. Now the the deepest and hardest and also rarest work for institutions to take on is the work that comes the closest to actually fulfilling the promise of the call to decolonize. And that is where museums and their leaders commit to moving beyond issues of representation and narrative and start to take on the governance and decision-making structures of their own institutions. The Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor, Maine is an example of a museum that has chosen to systematically affect organizational change in this way. The Abbey was founded in the 1920s as a private ethnographic and archaeological museum in what is now Acadia National Park. And it was built around a white physician's collection of artifacts from the Wabanaki Nation, a sovereign confederation of five native tribes in Maine. Around 2012 or so, the leadership of the museum convened its first Native Advisory Council. And in consultation with that council, they then made the decision to change the structure of their board of trustees to include five permanent reserved seats on the board for members of each tribe. And then they went about the work of establishing the priority of indigenous voices as a principle throughout every level of their institution. And so this was a strategy that was explicitly stated as a, as a move to go beyond their former approach, which involved consulting with relevant communities when developing their exhibitions and moving to a model in which authority for museum content was truly shared. And, um, they worked closely with the Ho-Chunk scholar, Amy Lone Tree, who has written powerfully about this shared authority model, as well as about its limits. And I think this, this focus on shifting power structures within the institution, this is often the step that can be missing in the increasingly ubiquitous DEIA infrastructure. So diversity, equity, inclusion, and access groups that are being established across museums and other cultural institutions. So frequently these groups are tasked with Enable and, and, excuse me, enabling and enacting pro progressive change, but the essential governance structures within which they work remain unchanged. And a, a rigid and hierarchical organization is not likely to be able to center subaltern or indigenous voices consistently, or to develop truly collaborative partnerships with source communities in which authority is shared. And so I wanna kind of think with all of you about how truly decolonial work would involve actually relinquishing power, committing to learning and growth at every level of an institution and remaking governance structures to relocate authority both within the institution and outside it. Now this doesn't happen in longstanding institutions without a lot of pain and conflict and it mostly doesn't happen at all. A few years ago, the British writer Sumaya Kasim wrote a searing essay um, called The Museum Will Not Be Decolonized, in which, she, in which she asks whether museums can ever really promote decolonial thinking from within. She asks if museums are so embedded in the history and power structures that, of, of colonialism that they will only end up co-opting decoloniality in their efforts. And she shared an, a narrative of her own experience working on a decolonial exhibition as part of a team of outside curators at a major regional art museum in the UK, the Birmingham um, Museum, the Birmingham Art Museum and Gallery. And she um, described her worry that the non-white participants um, who were curating this exhibition from outside, that they were being tokenized, that they were being exhibited rather than being given agency and power. She aired her worry that they were being exploited by being asked to do volunteer or undercompensated work. And she warned of the risk that 
decolon decolonization might become another empty buzzword. Decolonization as something that would be exhibited for display rather than a project taken on by the institution, a kind of inward looking project for the institution. There are many scholars and critics who insist that decolonizing museums is impossible. The curator and former ethnographic museum director Clementine de Liss has said that to work in a Western ethnographic museum is to quote, become contaminated, a condition from which there is no redemption. And the critical race scholars, Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang um, in an important essay called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor argue powerfully against the use of decolonization for most of the cultural work in the, the projects that I've described here. Decolonization specifically requires the repatriation of indigenous land and life. Decolonization is not a metonym for social justice. Certainly there's no pure, innocent, uncolonized museum that any institution can hope to return to because museums have developed with colonial purpose and with racialized agendas at their core. There is no decolonial act that can cancel the debts of history. But still, it does seem like museums have a choice. They can choose to strive for a collaborative process of repair, respect, and reciprocity. Whether they call it in decolonization or not, they can choose to privilege indigenous and subaltern knowledge and worldviews. They can challenge and acknowledge stereotypical representations of colonized people produced in the past. And they can discuss the hard truths of colonization or they can cling to the status quo and reinforce colonial categories by default. Most of the museum professionals that I know and work with certainly don't want to do that. They don't want to cling to the status quo. They don't want to reinforce colonial categories by default. Um, but the larger question is whether the leadership and infrastructure of these institutions is really ready to do this kind of deep reparative work. So I think I will um, leave it there for now. I think there's a lot to discuss, um, and I've said a lot of sort of polemical and <laughs> complicated things. Um, so I'd love to kind of move into conversation and eventually into questions. Thank you so much for that. That was, um, that just, it laid out a whole lot and there's so many dimensions to the question about decolonization and, and you really gave us um, a framework for thinking about the dimensionality and the, and the complications of the problem. I was really glad that you started, uh, or at least towards the beginning with the, um, the Natural History Museum in New York. Um, for those of you who have not been there um, on the Upper West Side, if you have any doubts about the colonial history of the museum, um, an afternoon spent in that place will, will, will disabuse you of that. Um, it's not just the collections, although there certainly is that. It's not just what has been amassed and, and, and compiled in that museum since I think 1877. But the taxonomies themselves are, are still basically 19th century taxonomies that have everything to do with ideas about human hierarchy and, and value. And um, so once several years ago, we took uh, a group of American studies juniors on a field trip there and turned them loose for an afternoon in that museum. And they were working in teams of, of five or so. And their, their only assignment was to come back um, and report on A, what can you learn in this museum that you believe you are intended to learn? Is there anything and what is it? And B, what with your critical eye can you learn that you are definitely not intended to learn? And one of our groups did this, they went rogue a little bit. It was pre-smartphone, but they, um, they had a video camera with them and they made this beautiful kind of mockumentary where they went around the museum and they interviewed I'm not really interviewed, but just questioned various um, museum officials. But the question was, where is the hall of European peoples? <laughs> and of course, <laughs> there's no hall of European peoples. There's a hall of African peoples. There's a hall of American Indians. There's a hall of Asian peoples. Um, and, but the, the response, um, as you might imagine, was, was quite priceless. Um, there's so many different places we might start with this. Um, Maybe I guess I want to start with um, the difference between decolonizing the museum and democratizing the museum, which I think are two very different things, but they, they are tangled in certain ways. Like the, the Smart Museum in Chicago, for example, has this wonderful docents project that involves 
um, training community members uh, from across Chicago, really, um, but they're based on the South Side, um, to do the work of the docents and to give tours, and they they train them in in art history and kind of give them the background that they need to. And that's that is not an insignificant practice, um, but it's not exactly what you're talking about either. So I, could you just reflect a little bit on what, what we might mean by democratizing and what we might and in relation to what you've told us about decolonizing and how do we think about that? Yeah, I mean, I suppose you know, what I've, I, I didn't think about this as I prepared this talk for the Democracy in America series, um, <laughs> but I really was focusing on, um, on sort of understanding the institutions, sort of museum institutions as kind of grounded in the colonial history that I've been trained on. And of course I come from, my, my training is, is in the history of modern Britain and in the history of science and museums in that setting. Um, and one of the one of the really interesting aspects of the kind of the 19th century history of kind of Victorian museums in, in Britain, at least, um, is that that's the period that's the period where they kind of shift from being they shift from this um, sort of model of the kind of private collection for an elite circle of gentlemen to kind of gather in and, and kind of have these experiences of sociality and knowledge together in to the idea of a kind of a public institution, right? And this, this mirrors something that happens across the sort of um, the history of many of the kind of disciplines of science and scholarship in that period is that, um, you know, science seems to become something that has a more kind of public dimension and you know, natural history museums are a key part of that. Um, and I guess what I'm, sorry, this is a kind of meandering response to that, but, I, but I'm very interested in the, the, the process by which museums began to present themselves to publics, even as the kind of the process of determining what goes on display in those places and how they're interpreted um, sort of becomes, uh, it, it, it narrows. It's a period of kind of professionalization and specialization in museum careers. Um, and so there's a kind of paradoxical kind of democratization. So now you know, the public can come to these places, they're, expen they're inexpensive or free to visit, but you're not empowered to, to question. You're not empowered to hold the objects the way that those elite um, kind of gentlemen were able to in the earlier history of the museum. And I guess one of the things that I'm really interested in in my pedagogy around museums, and, and it's why I love the example that you gave um, of the, you know, the class visiting the American Museum of Natural History. Like I'm really interested in, in teaching students um, and, and, and visitors in general to think of museums not just as a, as a leisure destination, um, you know, as a place to kind of go in and passively take things in, but as a place to question, right? So to kind of go in and say, why is this place here? What does it mean that it's here? How did these objects get here? What is my relationship to it as a visitor, um, as a member of its many publics? You know, what, what would it mean to look at, look actively when you enter these spaces? So not just at the objects that are on display or the interpretation that's presented, but to the institution presenting them? Can you see behind the curtain? Can you discern the underlying narrative of the museum, the things that it says it's about, the things that it's really about, right? And so I guess, you know, we can all, museums are public institutions, you know, all the museums, all the, at least the Yale museums and, and many of the museums in New Haven are, are free. Um, anyone can go in there, but are people really invited to have a stake in that institution? Are they invited to participate in meaning making? there. And so I guess that's where that's where the kind of like democratization angle on, on the, the processes that I've been describing, um, I think, come to the fore. Because museums are not just collections of objects. They are collections of people. And the placement of every object in those spaces, even the placement of chairs and water fountains, like all of that is a choice made by people. And those choices are a part of how meaning is made there. And we can participate in that passively by taking it in, but we can also kind of insist on having a role in, in kind of being a part of it. Right, yes, well, because meaning, meaning is made there, but meaning is also foreclosed there in certain ways, right? There, there are certain things that you are, are totally not meant to know by what is on display. Um, right. And that can be as actually as important as what you're intended to know. Um, 
Can you talk a little bit about your project, your ongoing project on um, Out of Place, where you're you're using yeah, uh, items from the collections and and talk? I mean, just describe the project to us, but also, um, can you talk a little bit about whether or how it has to do with these broader questions about decolonization? Yeah. Um, so um, this project that I called Out of Place um, is part of um, a sort of a longstanding interest I've had in trying to understand the kind of colonial nature of natural history museums and specifically in understanding the ways that the, the sort of um, division between what is nature and what is culture is created by those institutions. It's not something that is given. And I think we can see that in the, um, uh, the, the slide I showed earlier, um, the depiction of Olive Worm's Cabinet of Curiosities from the 17th century. Um, you know, these are spaces, natural history museums are spaces where, um, um, you know, objects that are found in nature, objects that are manipulated in some way, objects that are crafted, and sometimes kind of human remains are all displayed together. And so I was interested in trying to, in the first instance, kind of do some research on specific objects in the, um, in the Peabody Museum, objects that didn't, that might seem to be the most, um, apolitical or uncultural. And so I honed in, and this is partly from my, my background in the history of the physical sciences, I honed in on the mineralogy collection. Um, the, the Peabody Museum at Yale has an incredible mineralogy and meteoritics collection. And um, what I was interested in doing is, you know, working as I do at an institution that is focused on the history of British art and our um, permanent galleries are kind of structured um, by a narrative about British expansion and its kind of effects on the, the kind of visual art production over the centuries. Um, I wanted to try and see what would happen if you um, kind of recontextualize an object from one place where it appears to be just purely from nature and kind of place it into a space where it um, takes its seat among other objects of culture. And I became really interested in kind of tracking landscapes of mineral extraction in the former British Empire through objects at the Peabody. And as part of this project, I ended up collaborating with um, an artist based in Delhi, an Indian artist named Garima Gupta. Um, I wish I had actually included some of these things and to share in my PowerPoint at the end. Um, and so what, what the two of us did is I, I did some research on these 10 objects in the Peabody Museum, kind of tracing their movement from places like the middle of a mountainside in the Western Ghats in India to New Haven, or from um, uh, the, the bottom of a South African diamond mine to New Haven, um, to try and understand, to try and kind of reframe the, the Peabody Museum as an archive of British colonialism. And then to kind of point to the absences in the, um, the way that these histories of kind of, of mineral extraction and exploitation and kind of the diving of the British Empire underneath the surface of the earth, so not just encompassing the earth, but going deep into it, the way that those things are not visible in the history of British art as it's presented on our walls. And so the idea was to kind of to work with an artist who would um, kind of kind of collaborate with me, kind of go through my research, look at the archive of visual materials that I was gathering to, um, to try and understand and bring the kind of um, the histories of these objects into view for myself. And then she made, so, so she's, um, she focuses on kind of observational drawing in a natural history tradition, but then she's really interested in sort of layering archival imagery on top of those to, to sort of, um, to do what she calls a kind of decolonial act of observational drawing. And so her kind of observation is taking in a broader visual archive than just the object itself. And um, it was a really fun project and it was conceived as a, um, as a way of kind of um, bringing these two institutions, the Yale Center for British Art and the um, Yale Peabody Museum into dialogue with, with one another and to kind of question the foundational categories that each institution is grounded on. And so for the Peabody Museum, it's nature. And I would argue for the Yale Center for British Art, it's not art, it's, it's Britishness. What is Britishness, right? And so displaying um, a meteorite that, um, that fell from space and landed in Southern Namibia in the Yale Center for British Art. Why is this here? Um, displaying um, a, I'm trying to think of a, another good example from it. Um, 
displaying a, a chunk of rock and crystal from you know, deep within an Indian mountain in the Yale Center for British Art. What does that mean? And so the, this word, this title out of place, the, the intention there was to like really question place um, in a museum that's defined around uh, a national identity, British, Britishness, which is inherently in, unstable and it's like literally cracking apart at the seams right now. Um, and to kind of show that the category of nature is just as unstable. Um, and it was really fun to work with colleagues at the Peabody on this. And I think it, it felt very, it feels very in line with changes that they're hoping to make in their new, newly renovated space when they reopen a couple of years from now. Now the display at the Center for British Art is, is in question now because of our, our lengthy closure. So it's unclear um, sort of when or how or, or whether this will be displayed in the way it was originally conceived. Um, but um, I, I guess another thing I'll say about that is that um, I'm also really interested in thinking a little bit critically about the one practice that museums often turn to in their kind of decolonial projects that I didn't mention earlier, which is artist intervention. So inviting an outside artist to kind of come in and take a critical perspective on the collection and its displays. And the Natural History Museum has done that. And, and you know, many, many kind of large universal museums have just done this sort of thing. And um, I think there's a danger in, and I think these are incredible projects um, and I'm totally in support of them. I think there is also a danger in outsourcing the critical interventions to artists mm -hmm. and outsiders. And I'm really interested in, in kind of thinking within, within the institution and trying to kind of develop that critique from within. Um, but for some of the reasons that I've described tonight, that's a very, um, that's, that's a difficult endeavor um, and one that brings a lot of dangers and risks along with it. Yeah, right. Well, it's often, um, I don't think it is necessarily this, but the, the, some of the examples I know of, there's a kind of essentialism built into it where it's like, we're gonna invite this artist of color usually to come in and speak for all of the mute peoples who are on display in our museum in, in some fashion. Um, I think the, the intention is probably the right one, but the, the mechanisms are, are deeply problematic and no less problematic than the collections themselves. Yeah, and I guess uh, like one of the things I wanted to get at earlier in, in my presentation is the way that like, you know, part of the problem is when you're not focusing, not focusing on the power structure, you're not focusing on the infrastructure of the museum itself, you're not realigning the way decisions are made. It's sort of, it's another kind of a kind of top down, like outsource the work. Um, sort of a thing. And so I think that those, those, those interventions are extremely well intentioned and they do good work, but they don't do enough. Yes. Um, okay, I'm delighted to see um, a lot of questions have started to come in and I invite more. So please use the Q&A function. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna try to get to all of them, but I'm also gonna try to put them in, a, in an order that makes um, sense because there's a little bit of a random factor here. But so let me start with one that I think is in reference to what you were just speaking on. Um, can you say a bit more about how you see the critical intervention from within and why would it be dangerous? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess what I was alluding to there is this um, this danger that um, I guess I just kind of kind of want to requote Sumaya Kasim, who I who I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, she expresses this concern that um, decolonization was becoming another thing to be exhibited. Um, and in the quotation I showed, which I, I don't think I didn't kind of hone in on this aspect of it, um, but she said, and this is a, of course in the British context, she says, I do not want to see decolonization become part of Britain's national narrative as a pretty curio with no substance or worse for decoloniality to be claimed as yet another British accomplishment, the railways, two world wars, one world cup and decolonization. And so kind of, you know, if, if decolonization is what an institution is going to strive for, Kind of slotting it into the exhibition schedule isn't isn't the way to do that because it doesn't produce lasting change. It, it's it's exhibiting the possibility of change and then returning to the way things were. Okay, here's a question that goes it goes back to something that we were speaking on earlier, but it it's a really important question that a lot of people in a, a lot of different parts of the country and a lot of parts of our university are going to need to be thinking about. And that is, should museums even have cultural anthropological halls anymore? 
should they have anthropological halls? So like, should, I mean, I, I think it depends a little bit on what's meant in that question because um, should anthropological museums cease to exist is one possibility there um, right. or should, should the, the kinds of displays that they currently have um, continue? I mean, yes, I think go ahead, please gonna clarify something. The intention of the question seemed to be the former with the, yeah. the use of the word even. But let yeah. me just um, tinker with the question myself a little bit, um, because yeah. you used the word redemption at some point earlier. And, and I think that's a, maybe a, the best way to think about it. Like, can some of these practices be redeemed as problematic as they are on their, on their face and in their history? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the big question. Um, I, as a, as a museum practitioner myself, I don't work in an ethnographic museum, um, but I do feel, I, I don't think that the, the kind of historical practices of anthropology can be redeemed. I do wonder, or at least hope that these spaces might be redeemable, not completely, but that we might strive um, for some, for kind of reimagining these spaces as places where I guess where questions of repair and redress can kind of come to the fore more. Um, I think the risk with many of the um, sort of efforts to decolonize that I've described here today is that you risk kind of thinking too simplistically, right? You think that it's almost a framework of nostalgia. Like we can um, retreat back to an earlier stage in history. We can go back to before this colonial violence happened, um, that we can somehow cancel out our debts. But if instead, um, we kind of think like with the model of um, institutions like like um, like sites of conscience, you know, this this idea that you can kind of remake yourself as a place where you where you think about what happened and where you make small and increasingly bigger um, attempts at repair. And so, one interesting um, practice that some ethnographic collections are starting to do is explore a different set of re words than repatriation and um, return. Mm -hmm. So words like repair, re-entanglement. Um, that's one I've seen from the anthropologist Paul Basu who's been working with um, collections in London from, um, from Sierra Leone. This idea that you know, there are some objects that where they're not wanted back. So the question is not give it back. The question is where do we go from here? A relationship has been established through these um, through these histories, these colonial histories, and that relationship is always going to be there. So we can try and cultivate it in a new direction. And I know, I mean, I'm, I'm saying these things a little bit vaguely. I haven't reviewed some of the details of how those projects work, but I am really interested in, in kind of exploring that wider range of, of, of verbs beyond repatriate and return. Yes. Because yes. there are many museums where that's not the issue. Sorry, I want to make sure we get to more questions. <laughs> yes. No, so I'm going to bundle here are two questions that are, are basically pedagogical ones, but they're, I think they're pretty closely related to what you were just um, talking about. So um, question number one, but I'm going to ask you both of them. Question number one is, um, how much help do you think visitors need or should get from an institution? Should these um, should these interruptions or interpretations be heavy handed and clearly stated, or should visitors be asked to question and make connections about broader topics of decolonization on their own? What is expected from the visitor? And then question two from a different person, uh, in New Haven, a trip to the BAC, that's the British Arts Center, is, uh, is often part of um, elementary school. Is there a particular object that you would most want these young students to think about first? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm going to answer that first, um, only because something popped into my head right away. Um, and that is, and um, and this is something that's being discussed um, quite intensively within the YCBA right now. Um, there's an 18th century painting called Zebra um, by George Stubbs in our collection that um, depicts a South African um, animal, a zebra that was brought to London in the late 18th century um, and displayed in a menagerie and, um, and depicted by Stubbs in an incredibly, one of, it's one of the most exquisite paintings in our museum. It also happens to be one of the paintings that children are drawn to immediately. I have small children and it's their favorite painting in that collection. And so it, there's a kind of inherent interest to it that I think um, makes it a really excellent opportunity for thinking about the histories behind 
that object? Um, why, is there, why is there a zebra in the Yale Center for British Art? Why is this zebra depicted in a generalized English kind of woodland landscape, which is nothing like the landscape that it is from? Um, and you can kind of through dialogue, through kind of a kind of collaborative and questioning form of pedagogy, which, with my, which my colleagues in museum education are extremely skilled at doing, you can really um, invite young people to start to kind of imagine their way into these questions of, you know, they may not understand colonial history, but they certainly understand questions of identity, of belonging, of why it, does this belong here and what does it mean that it's here? Um, mm -hmm. Alongside the kind of aesthetic questions that we've maybe been more historically kind of primed to present to them in those spaces. And can you remind me what the first question was again? It was also- Well, the first one was a broader question about, um, I, I interpret it as a pedagogical question. How much, um, how much do you need to do to position visitors to understand or maybe re-understand the objects on display? Should it be heavy handed? Should you let them do their own work? Can, I guess, you know, can, um, can wall labels do the work of decolonization in some way? Yeah, um, yeah, that's well put. I mean, I don't think wall labels can do the work of decolonization. And I think, um, you know, I and other museum professionals know that like many people, maybe even most people never read the labels. And so you can't, it's, it's gonna be a failing strategy to assume that kind of didactic text is the way to help visitors question and experience um, museum objects in, in these ways. Um, but there is a, I mean, there is a, a, a thriving and expert world of kind of, you know, museum pedagogy in which people have been experimenting with all sorts of ways of kind of making meaning collaboratively with museum visitors. It's all very experiential. And so it, um, you know, a lot of it is highly dependent upon being able to like have these sort of social interactions around the object, which makes them necessarily small scale. Um, and I don't know whether it's possible to, to, to do it in a way that's more, um, you know, like um, uh, that can just be encountered on one's own. But, you know, I think a lot of, I don't know, I think that there are, there's a lot more than wall text that's available to us. There's also sound installations and audio tours and guided tours and, um, you know, maps and treasure hunts, which, you know, historically have been um, pitched towards children, but I think a lot of institutions are thinking more about how can we encourage visitors to chart their own path through these institutions, um, make their own argument for how these things connect in a more kind of fluid and empowering way. Great. Um, let's see a couple of questions that are kind of broadly about the museum world. The first one, um, how do college and university museums of art and science compare with state and private museums in terms of challenges and opportunities around the needs that you described for restoration, repair, uh, re-entanglement, uh, and shared authority models? That's, yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, I, I've never worked in a um, non-university museum, at least not as a, um, I have as a researcher, but, um, but not as a curator or a museum professional. So I don't have a lot of experience in knowing the kind of, I don't know, the kind of interior workings and possibilities that are there. I do think that um, one of the great advantages of being at a university museum um, is having that kind of direct connection with scholars and practitioners who are in kind of adjacent academic spaces to the museum, um, especially in fields like indigenous studies, where kind of recognition of the value of collaboration and reciprocity and privileging indigenous voice and authority is increasingly common, right? And there are other fields too, historians, history, history of science, anthropology, I mean, just there's having access to a, not just a community of experts, that's not so much what I mean, but a, but a community that has been explicitly designed as a learning community, a kind of thinking and questioning community. And I think kind of cultivating that sort of internal culture of questioning and learning can often be a challenges for, for kind of big public institutions. And so, you know, being in a university town like this one, I think is an incredible opportunity to set up those connections um, and kind of, you know, having a, yeah, just having more critical voices because, you know, students are increasingly empowered to ask questions of museums that, you know, belong to their universities and try to hold them accountable. Right. 
Um, this might have to be our last question. We'll see. Um, there are still one or two that we haven't gotten to. Um, uh, this is a, a question about museum economics. Um, many museums seem to rely on wealthy donors who may have a large say in what the museums exhibit. Many have wings named for people we do or do not approve of. Um, just how realistic and attainable is decolonization if these don donors see this project as politicizing the museum? Yeah, I think this is a big question. Um, it's certainly the case that more kind of independent fun funding for cultural institutions would leave them more free to enact cutting edge practices and incorporate critique and, and all these sorts of things. However, I, I do get the sense, I mean, you know, thinking about the, the sort of decolonization process that I alluded to at the Abbey Museum in which kind of control over the museum um, was, you know, more or less handed, like not just shared, but kind of handed over to Wabanaki people. Um, I listened to an interview with the director, or rather the former director of that museum in which she says that like, it, it is true that when they decided to make these changes, there were certain donors who turned away from them. But she also pointed out that, you know, you know, they made their decolonizing agenda very explicit. They made sure that nobody could miss that this was happening and that this was, they, was what they were about. And there were other donors who were interested in that and who wanted to support it. And so I think that, it, it, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a fundraiser. I don't have any experience in that. I, 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 I think and hope that it should be possible to kind of redirect fundraising in these different directions. I mean, another example is, um, or another kind of strategy that I've heard of museums doing is kind of working, working to kind of develop community fundraising projects where it's lots and lots of small donors who can kind of together, um, um, you know, make something happen when a large donor can't come in. And um, a, a colleague of mine at the Art Gallery of Ontario recently worked closely with the Caribbean community in Toronto, which is a huge and important community there. Um, to acquire a major archive of Caribbean photography for, for their museum that wouldn't have been possible with a single donor. And so I, I hope that this is just, that it's more possibility rather than closing off possibilities. Right, right. Um, well, so we'll close out if you'll allow us to go two minutes over. Um, sure. This is the first comment that came in, but it seems like an apt one to end on. Can I'll give you the last word, but just to, to think about kind of your take on how heartened or not you are by some of the changes that are taking place. So here's the comment. Um, there are um, museal micro practices that change the mood of a museum. Two brief examples. The Field Museum in Chicago has a wonderful West Coast first people's exhibit that is very different in mood and approach than the older galleries. I also think of the Detroit Museum of Fine Arts that has worked very hard to democratize access by holding a huge number of community events, many aimed at kids from under, un, underserved com communities uh, in the museum, kids drawing in the Mesoamerican galleries, kids playing chess tournaments in the museum, but also through a lot of uh, very good explanatory signing. What was the Baroque period? How do you pronounce Baroque? What is this art about? Uh, making sure that there feels like less of a class barrier to interacting with the art. Every time I see such initiatives succeeding, I feel very heartened. Um, so I invite you to take the last word and, and come maybe comment on some of these practices, but also kind of what is your vibe at this moment about what is happening in the museum world? Yeah, I mean, I, I am heartened by developments like, like, um, like the ones that were just listed. I do have a certain amount I mean, I don't want to go out on a pessimistic note exactly, but um, I guess, you know, one reason that I ended my- This is democracy my... in America, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're allowed, you're allowed, you're allowed <laughs> for the pessimism. All right, well, thanks. I mean, one reason that I ended my presentation or almost ended it with this question of kind of remaking governance structures and how hard it is and how it doesn't happen without kind of pain and conflict and opposition is that I, I really see that as the essential work. Like that's the work I hope for. And that's the work I want to be a part of um, eventually. And I think that that is, I don't feel like terribly optimistic that you know many major museums are gonna do that kind of work because of how much they have to give up in order to do it, right? Like it's not just giving up or giving back contested objects. 
not just letting go of entrenched narratives that that shore up their own identities. It's not just, you know, it's, it's not just that, it's, it's really relocating authority, relinquishing power and kind of handing over um, the control of the narrative to others. And so what's often so exciting in, um, you know, really innovative and democratizing education projects is the way that on a kind of small scale, they create moments where that kind of reversal and collaboration is happening, but it doesn't affect the kind of larger structure of power within the institution. It doesn't change the way that decisions are made. And so it doesn't change the controlling narrative of the institution. And museum educators are often lower status in those museums than say the kind of curators and the higher level administrators. And so it's, it's the most, it's in, in some sense, the most important work, but it's often the kind of, it doesn't get the support it needs. And yeah, so unfortunately um, I do feel a lot of pessimism but you know, as a as a museum professional myself, like the way I make sense of my role in these institutions is by at least trying to do work that I can describe as decolonial, even if it means it's just a step towards an impossible goal that we'll never get to. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much. And I think I think that you you relayed that to us in your opening when you basically said this is this is not going to be a manifesto. Um, and there was a kind of ambivalence in your opening that I think was very suggestive of exactly what you're saying now about your position within the institution and your hopes for changing the institution. Um, this hour has flown past. I yeah. hope that you would agree to come back because this is a topic obviously we are not done with. And um, there are a lot of people on the call who would love to hear more from you. So maybe we can arrange to have another session um, sometime soon, but thank yeah. you so much for taking the time. It's thank really you it's so been, much. And it's thank you to great. the audience for asking such good questions and being a part yeah, of it. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thanks, thanks for coming. I want to remind you, um, Friday at noon, we have Christopher Newfield uh, speaking on democracy and the modern university. Does post-democracy need universities? Um, that will be at noontime. Um, and uh, in the meantime, take good care of yourselves. Don't let your guard down. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face. Wear a mask. Get your vaccine. And uh, take care, everybody. Good night. Good and night. thank you again, Chitra. You're welcome.